Jeremy, do you know if this is recording or Phil, can you see it? I'm not able to see it where I'm sharing the screen. Yeah, I I've guess... got a recording uh, icon lit up. Okay, good deal. Folks, we have Stacy White with us tonight. Yeah, I can tell it's recording. Okay. Uh, we have Stacy White with us tonight. Stacy is the Ag and Natural Resources Agent in Whitley County, Kentucky. Um, and Stacy uh, is a longtime trapper and an outdoorsman and uh, very knowledgeable. And so uh, we're going to let him do his talk and uh, then there will be questions at the end. Hey, thank you, Shad. I appreciate the opportunity to do this and to share this information with folks. Uh, just a little bit about my background. I've uh, been in extension almost 20 years, uh, 18 years in Bell County and going on two years in Whitley County now. Uh, my education's in forestry, my bachelor's in forestry, and then a master's in uh, wildlife management. Uh, <clears throat> so I've always enjoyed being out in the woods, uh, hunting, trapping, fishing, whatever. And uh, trapping's kind of the thing that really uh, trips my trigger, so to speak, uh, no pun intended. So I'll talk to you tonight about just some basic trapping stuff and uh, trapping as a wildlife management uh, option. So if you'll start those slides, Shad, we'll talk about each one. All right, what is trapping? Trapping is the use of a device to remotely catch an animal. So most folks have used a snap trap to catch a mouse. So that's the very essence of trapping. You're not sitting there waiting for the animal to come and you're gonna shoot it or lasso it or whatever. You've got a device that you put out there and then the animal encounters that device and then if everything goes right, you capture that animal. Uh, could be a mouse in your kitchen. Next slide. Could be a 40 plus pound beaver in the river or creek behind your house, whatever. But the, the definition of trapping, the function of the traps is the same. There's something little or big. So, um, I'm hearing something, Shad, is that? Okay, I don't hear it now. Uh, <clears throat> but trapping is a wildlife management tool. And, uh, you know, we think about an animal like deer, the primary tools to manage their deer herd would be guns and bows. But if you think about beaver, coyotes, some of our other fur-bearing animals, uh, we do hunt and use guns and bows with them sometimes, but traps are the most effective uh, tool that we've got to, to manage those animals and to keep their population levels uh, where we want to keep them at. Maybe, uh, you know, for property damage reasons or just to keep the population healthy or whatever. Now, I've, I'm 53 years old. I probably started trapping when I was about 10 or 11. And uh, it's, it's enjoyable, it's a lot of fun. I think it's a, a skill, a heritage skill, so to speak, that has been neglected by a lot of folks. And I think uh, it's very important to keep these heritage skills going and to pass them on to the next generation. I think in times when uh, we talk about food insecure areas in Kentucky, uh, there's times that traps could put food on your table. And I think, uh, I think it's just good to have those tools and the knowledge on how to use them. All right, next slide. So why do we trap? And there's a list, food, fur, wildlife management, pest control, and there may be other reasons too. You may just enjoy it and, and like to get out and do that. It's good mental exercise, good physical exercise. Uh, picture on that slide is a cornfield in Bell County. You can't see it, but the Cumberland River is just to the right of that slide. And that's probably about a quarter of an acre of standing corn that was cut and took into the river by beavers. And you can see the trail there where they were dragging that uh, into the river. 
and then they store it in there and then they feed on it in the winter time. So that's one example, maybe of property damage that the farmer might not want that to happen. So the way to do that is to, to reduce the number of beavers in that area uh, when that corn is, they seem to hit the corn when it first starts to dry down. When it's really green and growing, they don't bother it. But at that point where it starts drying down, they seem to really hone in on it. Once it's completely dry, then they seem to leave it alone too. But this particular location that picture's from, the first year I trapped that spot, I think we took 14 beavers out of the area joining that cornfield. So they can do quite a bit of, uh, have quite a bit of impact in an area. Okay, next slide. Trapping is regulated by Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. Uh, notice if you get a hunting guide, it says hunting and trapping guide. And that's a, they have the general guidelines in there. There is a season for trap fur bears. Um, there's a license requirement. Even if you own the land you're trapping on, there's a landowner's license that you have to have. There's equipment guidelines. Uh, for instance, uh, trap size. Foothold traps on land in Kentucky, meaning not in the water, but on dry land, can only have a maximum inside jaw spread of six inches. And a body grip trap can have on dry land a maximum jaw spread no greater than seven and a half by seven and a half. Now, once you move those traps into the water, then that size restriction is not there. But, uh, but those are some of the things that the regulations lay out on, on the trapping equipment. <clears throat> and then there's methods that are, uh, it spells out, you know, how methods that you can use. Some things are, are not legal, not ethical. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of things you hear about people doing this or that to catch coyotes or whatever. Uh, or maybe using dynamite to get rid of beavers. There's a lot of things that may sound interesting, but they're not legal. So we need to be legal, ethical in anything that we do. Now that bottom note there says NWCOs. That is an acronym for Nuisance Wildlife Control Operators. And so you've got trappers that are fur bear trappers that trap during the trapping season, but there's also another license you can get and you can actually be a nuisance wildlife control operator. And uh, trapping is a method that a lot of those folks use to, uh, to manage nuisance wildlife. And that's not just during the fur bearing season, that's year round. Now, it's a little more involved. You have to take a test to get that license. I think it's $100 a year to maintain that license. And then you have to turn in a record each year of what animals you've caught and what you did with them, uh, whether you trapped them or shot them or whatever. So it's, uh, it's kind of an industry of its own. And uh, currently and for several years now, really the, the only profitable way to trap to any extent is to be a nuisance wildlife control operator where people are paying you to remove those nuisance animals. Fur prices have not been good for a while. And with the expense it takes, gas and, and equipment expense, it's very difficult to make a profit just with fur. Now that, that can change real quick with the markets, but, uh, but trapping is more than just about the money. Like I say, it's a heritage skill and a very useful, it's very useful knowledge to have. All right, next slide. Now, question for all of you all, what kind of trap is that? And y'all can unmute, unmute and tell me what kind of trap that is. Not everybody at once. That's a live trap. All right, live trap. Phil? Live trap. All right. It's also a live trap. All right, and I can't see all the names. Woody? It's a live trap. 
Okay, Jennifer. Or Ricky. Live trap. Okay, all right, next slide, Chad. What kind of trap is that? I'm gonna start back over, Chad. I would say that's a, a hold trap. Okay, Phil. Foothold trap. Jeremy. Foothold trap that's also a live trap. Uh, you're cheating. Woody. It's foothold trap. All right, Lee. Or Jennifer or Ricky. Foothold trap. Okay, it's kind of a trick question, but both of those are live traps. They're both live capture devices. All right, next slide, Chad. Nothing about either one of those. No, back up one. Nothing about either one of those traps actually kills the animal. A better name for the one on the left is a cage trap, and the one on the right is a uh, foothold trap. Sometimes you hear it called a leg hold trap, but does it actually catch an animal by the leg or does it catch it by the foot? So actually to, it's designed to catch an animal by the foot, not by the leg, okay? Now, each trap has different purposes. Uh, cage traps, they have their place. Uh, some animals readily go into a cage trap. There's probably been as many or more raccoons caught with a cage trap as, as any other trap design. And there's places this is the right trap to use. If you're trapping in a, a residential area, in a barn, somebody's backyard, subdivision down the road, whatever, uh, there's places that the cage trap is the way to go because you can... Uh, you can easily, uh, you know, release unwanted catches just by, you know, opening the trap door and letting it out. Uh, so you got you got to learn what traps to use and where to use them, what the traps are, how they're designed, and uh, you know, use the right tool for the right application. Of course, obviously, there's different sizes of all these traps depending on what animal uh, you're trying to catch. Some people say, well, you know, that cage trap is a have a heart. It's more humane. Is it any more humane than a foothold trap? Do animals in the cage trap have any chance of injury? And the truth is, you know, an animal could get injured, not intentionally, but, uh, you know, they don't like being in that cage. So it's not necessarily any more humane than that foothold trap. Stacey, I've actually had animals in a, a live or a cage trap here that have died. I don't know if it was from stress or uh, what it was exactly, but they they died in that trap. Stress, stress is a major factor, especially for some animals. If you're, uh, squirrels are probably the worst. It's hard to keep a squirrel alive in a cage trap. They just, they freak out and they basically kill themselves. But anyway, just making a point that, that these are all devices that we use to restrain an animal. In a cage trap, the animal goes in, it's restrained inside that cage trap. Next slide, the foothold traps, the animal steps on the pan, the springs cause the jaws to close and grip the paw of the animal. And then obviously you've got the chain fastened in such a way that the animal's restrained by the foot. And uh, it, it's still, I mean, they're live restraint devices is what they are. Now there are times that you can, depending on how you set these foothold traps, you can make them lethal. You can have a lethal water set using foothold traps. If you're trapping muskrats, one of the most humane things you can do is have your foothold trap in such a way, if you're trapping muskrats with foothold traps, have them set in such a way that that muskrat can get in deep water real quick. That trap will take him to the bottom and he expires rather quickly. And that's 
one of the most effective ways to trap uh, muskrats and other water animals too, mink, raccoon, otters, beaver. Uh, and there's different size traps for those animals. Obviously a trap you use for a muskrat, foothold trap for muskrats much smaller than a foothold trap would be for a beaver. These foothold traps in the picture there, the one on the left is a double long spring. There are also single long springs. One on the right is a coil spring. It's different uh, designs. The long spring trap on the left is, is the oldest design, been around for centuries. The coil spring trap is, uh, has come around later on in life, but it's been around long enough that, that pretty much the coil spring traps are, are used more prevalent now than the long spring traps. Okay. This is a body grip trap. This is not a live capture device. This is a lethal trap. Very much the same as that mouse trap on our opening picture was a lethal trap. That mouse trap is designed to kill the mouse. These body grip traps, also sometimes referred to as conibear traps, are designed to kill the animal that, that tries to pass through the trap. The word conibear, if you hear them called conibear traps, that comes from the gentleman in Canada that, that developed these traps. His name was Frank Conibear. He developed these, I think, back in the early 50s. And they, they revolutionized uh, one aspect of trapping, muskrat trapping in particular, and beaver trapping. These, these body grip traps are very effective tools uh, when used correctly. So basically that spring compre compresses those jaws hinge open and that little trigger thing on top is hooked into the, the wire mechanism. And when that animal tries to go through there, it, it turns those jaws loose and then it smacks the animal in the back of the head or the neck and it renders them unconscious and they die shortly thereafter. Okay. All right. Snares are another trap. Snares are basically, uh, modern snares are basically a steel cable with a uh, closing device or a lock, whatever you want to call it up there on the end that forms the loop. In Kentucky, a legal snare, uh, has that closing device has to be one piece. It cannot be multiple pieces that cause it to lock up solid. It's a one piece closing device. And that's uh, very important to keep in mind because there are some on the commercial market that are legal in other states that are not legal uh, in Kentucky. And I know uh, Phil's in Virginia I'm not familiar with Virginia's regulations. Uh, and then there's, there's also a term of uh, a cable of restraint versus the word snare. And that's kind of semantics, but some states allow cable restraints, but they don't allow, allow snares. And that's kind of uh, splitting hairs. And you have to make sure that whatever you're using in the state you're in, that it's legal, but these are very effective tools. This is the cheapest way, the cheapest way to get into trapping because that snare right there for less than two bucks, you can have that snare and have a trap to capture whatever animal you're trying to capture where the traps are, are much more expensive than that. Okay, next slide. Species specific trap, of course, obviously, uh, this is designed for a raccoon. Uh, when it's set, that U-shaped wire piece, uh, the spring compresses, that goes across that opening. The trigger sets in a notch back there. When a raccoon sticks his front foot in there to get the bait out, he'll pull that trigger or push that trigger to find, depending on which kind of trap you got, some are pull trap, some are push and pull. But anyway, he sets the trigger off when he's trying to get the food out with his paw. And that, that's kind of revolutionized raccoon trapping because uh, they're very effective and you don't have to, uh, I don't want to say this wrong, but you don't have to, to be the best trapper in the world to, to catch a raccoon with one of these. I mean, you put the bait in it, fasten it, stick it in the ground, the raccoon will find it and stick his paw in it to get the bait. So there's not a whole lot of, uh, 
thought that necessarily has to go into it as long as you've got it in the right location. You don't have to worry about trap placement or solid bedding or anything like that. The raccoon will, will do the work for you once he finds it. These are also called dog proof traps because uh, if you look at that, that hole is just a little over an inch in diameter. So a dog can't stick his paw down in there and pull that trigger. And uh, so you can use these, uh, you know, around barns and whatever, if there's dogs running loose, you don't have to worry about the dogs getting caught and having to turn them loose. Okay, next slide. I'm just gonna go through the different animals and tell you what traps that I would suggest uh, for these different fur bears in Kentucky. Obviously that's a beaver. And uh, now you really can't tell in the picture, but he's basically got his front foot caught in a snare. That snare was in a trail going into the creek where he was coming up on the bank, cutting trees. And for whatever reason, he got through the snare, but got one foot hung in it. So he's, he's tied up by that one foot. But with beavers, uh, snares, body grip traps are at least eight by eight and bigger in the water and foothold traps in the water. I like to use a number five, which is a seven or seven and a half inch jaw spread trap. Uh, there are some bigger than that. Uh, there's a, some of them are seven, seven and a half inches. I mean, big eight and a half inches. There's a TS 85, it's eight and a half inches. But the reason we want, and most of us prefer a big foothold trap for beavers, their back foot is rather large. A full grown beaver's back foot will be as big as a man's hand. And so when you're foot trap, using foothold traps for beavers, you want that trap big enough that his whole foot will fit in there. And uh, quite, quite effective. So snares, foothold traps, body grip traps, and there are some cage traps designed for beavers, but they're rather expensive. But all of those in the right location are the appropriate tool. You know, if I'm walking, if I am have to park my truck and walk, say a mile to catch some beavers, I'm probably gonna think snares are the way to go. If, uh, if I can just back my truck into the, the dam where they're working, foothold traps or the bigger body grip traps are a lot easier that way because you're not having to carry all the equipment so far. And then two, sometimes animals if uh, you run into a beaver every now and then that's been trying to be trapped with body grip traps and they kind of get shy of them and then you've got to do something different and so snares and footholds come into play pretty good with those that get shy of the the body grip traps all right next slide raccoons uh, uh cage traps the raccoon specific traps, foothold traps, and then body grip traps that are uh, from say five inches by five inches up to the seven and a half by seven and a half. In the right situation, any of those body grip traps will, will effectively catch raccoons. And you can basically use snares on all these animals. It's just a matter of the, the particular size cable and where you set uh, set those snares. Snares are set in trails in such a way that the movement of the animal closes the snare down on them as they're walking through, okay? Snares in Kentucky, and I forgot to mention this a while ago, but snares in Kentucky cannot be spring assisted. So, you know, the old Davy Crockett movies or whatever where a tree's been over and somebody steps in the snare and they're hanging up in the air, that's not what snaring is. And then also, some states have spring assisted snares that are kill springs so that when they catch an animal, the spring puts tension on the snare so they quickly kill the animal. Those are not legal in Kentucky either. Okay. I should have mentioned that earlier, but I forgot. All right. Muskrats, like I said there a little bit ago, those small body grip traps are, are they're a really good tool for muskrats. Uh, that's a farm pond. That's my daughter there. She went with me one day to check traps. But you can find those muskrat dens in the pond bank, stick those body grip traps over that 
that den entrance under the water and next trip out, you know, usually it's a pretty sure set. Uh, we also use uh, a different kind of cage trap with them or something called a colony trap. It's basically a multiple catch trap. You can put that over the den and, and a, a rat can go in, but he can't come back out. The next one can go in, he can't come back out. Sometimes you can catch multiple ones in those. Some of them are designed like a, a minna trap with a funnel. Some of them have got a swinging door that just swings in but not out. And then foothold traps too are, are effective for muskrats in, uh, in the right situation where there are feed beds and slides where you can catch them with foothold traps. And like I said, foothold sets with muskrats need to be in such a way that, that they quickly drown because they have very fragile bones in their feet and legs and so they don't need to sit there alive in a foothold trap and snares are not a good option for muskrats just not the, the best option all right next and there is a uh, silver fox right a uh, possum, uh, basically the same thing as a raccoon, except those dog proof traps are not as effective for them. They will get caught in them sometimes, but uh, cage traps, foothold traps, uh, snares in the right situation can work. But uh, best way to catch a, a possum is to make the best bobcat set that you can picture in your mind or the best coyote set. And it seems like a possum will just come and jump in it for no reason. All right, next one, skunks. Everybody loves skunks. Uh, all the above mentioned tools work, cage traps, foothold traps, body grip traps, uh, snares could, you can catch anything in a snare, but that wouldn't be my choice of tools for a skunk. Um, and, and the big thing with skunks are the odor. So, I mean, if you're trying to remove skunks around residential areas or whatever, you have to be careful. Uh, you know, you don't, you don't want to spray up the neighborhood. And one of the best ways to do that, if you use cage straps and then you've got that cage strap covered uh, with cardboard or plastic or something, if that skunk can't see you, then he normally won't spray. So if he can't see you and you can get the cage and and take it away from the house or wherever you've caught it and uh, dispatch it in such a way that it doesn't spray, then that makes life a whole lot simpler. Uh, and there are kits, uh, there are traps you can buy already made that way. If you've got this regular cage trap, like I said, you can cover it with cardboard or plastic, cover it all the way, all four sides, leave the ends open and just don't let him see you and then he usually doesn't spray. If you've got it in a cage strap that's not covered, if you're really careful, you can take a thick blanket and walk up and cover the trap up and then move it that way. And uh, just don't, don't do it if it's real windy. I've had that experience and the blanket blowing over them like a flag will cause them to spray quite rapidly. And make sure there are no pet dogs or anything around when you're fooling with them because they don't like them either. Okay, next. Groundhog's not really a fur bear, but a lot of our uh, home gardeners and stuff, these, these cause a nuisance. Uh, cage traps and then uh, body grip traps that are five to six inches up to the seven and a half. That body grip trap over their den entrance is a pretty good set. Uh, if you're trapping them with cage traps, fresh apple, Cantaloupe, uh, that seems to work pretty good, pretty good for them. I will say this, groundhogs can't take a lot of sunlight. So if you're trapping them, it'd be more humane to check those traps first thing in the morning, not leave them sitting in a cage out in the full sunlight. And I would say that with any, any animal, check those traps early, don't leave them out there in the sun. Uh, Footholds will work with groundhogs, but snares are not the best option. All right, next. Some people have rabbit issues in their gardens. Uh, my opinion, the best tool for a rabbit is a homemade 
box trap, which you can catch them in the cage trap, the smaller cage traps. If you're using the cage trap, rake, scoot it back and forth in the loose dirt so that the dirt is up in the cage. So they're walking on dirt and not on that wire. And that seems to work a lot better. You can catch them in body grip traps if you know where their holes are and put that trap over that entrance will work pretty well. But uh, the wooden box traps that we used to make when we were little work really good for rabbits too. All right, next. Coyotes, and this is coyote. Uh, when I was young, we didn't have any. So sometime uh, in the 80s, Sometime in there, coyotes got started and they've really come on strong. They're everywhere. This is the toughest fur bear that we've got to deal with in Kentucky as far as trapping. They're very intelligent. Uh, you have to really be on your game to catch very many of them. Uh, but also they're, they're tough to hold in a foot trap. You've got to have good equipment and you got to make sure that you've got them fast and good because they're very strong. They work trying to get out of that trap very much more, quite a bit much more than other animals. Most animals will kind of tussle with it a little while and then just lay down. A coyote just keeps, keeps working, trying to get loose. The tools that I would use for coyotes are foothold traps and snares. Uh, the body grips and cage traps are not a good option for them. Um, <clears throat> one of the most effective methods with coyotes is a snare in a fence crawl through, which is basically a place that they've been going through a fence into a farmer's field. And they'll use those same uh, crawl throughs uh, pretty regular. And you can, you can watch for hair on the fence, watch for a trail through the weeds under that fence. And that's a very effective uh, set for coats. Uh, foothold traps need to be at least uh, probably a five, five inch jaw spread up to a six inch jaw spread. And they need to be good quality, strong traps to, to hold these animals. You gotta make sure that you've got them fastened really well because these are strong. Some of these coyotes will get up to 30, 35 pounds, maybe a little more. And that's a big animal to try to hold by the foot, okay? There's a couple of others that I didn't put in here. I thought they were in here, but they're not. Uh, but bobcats and otters are, uh, are fur bears a lot of people trap. Uh, bobcats, I would use uh, foot traps and snares primarily. There are some cage traps designed for bobcats that work pretty well. Uh, some situations you can catch them in body grips, but that's not the best option in my opinion. Bobcats are, uh, they're pretty easy to hold once you catch them. The, the trick is just finding where they're at. They're very much a creature of habit. But once you catch them, they, uh, I mean, they're not as hard to hold as a coyote. I've caught, uh, I've caught several bobcats in a, in a one and a half size foot trap, which is basically a four and a half inch jaw spread up to a six inch jaw spread, but you don't have to have as heavy equipment as you would with coyotes, but you still have to have it fast and good and uh, use good equipment. And then otters, uh, the, the two primary tools for otters would be your body grip traps and foothold traps. Uh, foothold traps would need to be, uh, you know, at least a four and a half inch jaw spread. Uh, and if you're in the water, you can go up to, to as big as you want to, but really they're not, uh, they're, they're, they're pretty strong and their feet are kind of tapered and, and kind of like the muskrat, you would want him in deep water as quick as you could to get him dispatched, but, uh, but you don't necessarily have to have as big a trap as with a beaver. Uh, so uh, four and a half inch on up to the seven inch are options for foothold traps for otter. Uh, body grip traps are very effective for them. You would want to go at least the six by six inch size on up to the, to the bigger ones that you would use for beavers. A lot of people like the eight by eight 
size trap, which is too big to be on dry land, has to be in the water, but that's a good size trap for otters. A body grip trap that's eight by eight is uh, a very good option for otters. So that kind of covers most of the fur bears that we got here in Kentucky. I didn't mention mink, but they're very similar to, uh, to muskrat on the trap size. Most mink are gonna be caught in the small body grip traps or foothold traps. And there again, you want them underwater as soon as possible. To get more information about trapping, you can contact your extension office. Uh, we have resources that we can hook you up with. And the next slide there, Shad. Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, that's a good resource. They have a fur bear biologist, Laura Palmer. She's our state fur bear biologist. And uh, they can be a big help to you. And then we have a couple of trappers associations. The next slide, Shad, is United Trappers of Kentucky, which I'm part of that group. There's also Kentucky Fur Takers, but uh, both trappers associations, no, back up. Both trappers associations are big on education. We try to educate people that want to learn how to trap, especially young people that are trying to get into it. They've got an interest. We'll teach them how to do that. We have, we have educational programs across the state. We, we do two meetings, one in the spring and one in the fall. Uh, where people can come and we do all kinds of educational events at those meetings. We also go into the schools. I've, I've been in several high schools in the vo vocational agriculture program uh, and, and teach trapping in those places. Uh, I've got a, a program that I do called Kentucky Fur Bears where I take pelts and traps. And I've been in uh, 4-H camps with those. I've been in several environmental camps. I've uh, been to Harlan County, uh, been there in Letcher County, uh, and several other counties that we've done that program in. And uh, it, it's good to, to educate folks. And not only folks that want to learn how to trap, we also educate folks about what trapping is and what it's not. Trapping is a wildlife management tool. These traps are tools. They're not inhumane they're not humane they're just a tool it's how you use it that determines the the humaneness or the kindness or whatever term you want to use i mean they're tools just like hammers screwdrivers guns whatever and it's how you use them that determine whether it's good bad or whatever all right and i think the last slide is just a picture with the question so uh if anybody's got questions, I'll be glad to try to answer those. I believe that folks can unmute themselves. Um, if you've got a, a question to ask or a comment. That picture there on that last slide, that was at a horse farm a uh, creek running through the middle of it and the beavers had it dammed up where their pasture fields were all swamped, basically. You can see in that picture, well, you could. This one? No, the last picture down at the bottom. That's where the last one on there. There, right there. You can okay. see how big the beavers' back feet are in that picture if you look at that. You can see their tail, but those tails are probably 12 inches long, the leather part, and you can see how big that back foot is. There's two muskrats on top of that dog box there, but that was, uh, that was a, a place in Bell County that had horses and they basically lost their pastures for a while due to a rise in the water table, so. Helped them quite a bit to take those out. Okay, any questions from anybody? Hey, Stacy, I will add. Um, you know, I think you one of the underlying things you've mentioned here tonight is um, it, it's a family affair. Uh, it it's is. not that hunting or fishing, that, but trapping is a family affair. And uh, I know Phil said he had a, his, his boys. Uh, 
there with him that in and I know you all of your kids have been has, has been out on the trap line as well many times so definitely it's a family affair which is a which is a good thing getting the next generation started it is and it's it's a good teaching tool they learn they learn a good work ethic and like I say they learn a skill that who knows it may come in pretty handy in the future Any other comments or questions? Stacy, those, those muskrats, play. those muskrats and beavers are edible. In case anybody's wondering, go ahead, Phil. I was just going to wonder: uh, uh, Do you have uh, any thoughts on what the markets are liable to do over the next few years? I mean, I guess it's anybody's guess, but uh, well, to be frank with you, uh, China is probably going to be a positive influence on the fur market, you know, without getting too political. Uh, China's a big buyer, and so they've not been as aggressive with the economic situation. Uh, I don't want to say more than I should, but uh, if they become more influential in our economy, it may cause the fur prices to go back up. Is that is that clear enough? That, that is okay very diplomatic yeah but you know there's ways to get around that too i mean the, the raw fur market's not good right now but like i say like those beavers in that picture right there pelt's not worth a whole lot but each one of them's got two casters on there which are scent glands that are bringing 80 some dollars a pound right now and those, those casters are used in the lure business, also used in the perfume industry. And for whatever reason, it's used to make strawberry food flavor. So there's a market for those glands. And actually the glands are worth more than the pelt right now. Hmm. I'm just wondering why the first guy said, well, I could make that taste like strawberries. <laughs> But from what I've read, that's that's one product they make out of it. You can also tan those pelts yourself or have them tanned and make crafts out of them. Some of these, uh, uh, I forget what you call them, but like kind of look like a dream catcher, but they've got a pelt stretched in the middle of them. Some of that crafty stuff in the right place can bring good money. Very good. Okay. Any other yeah. And anybody that wants to know more about trapping, I'm more than happy to uh, talk to you and give me a call, whatever. Uh, I enjoy talking about it. Like I said, it's uh, it's been part of my life for a long, long time. My grandpa got me started. And uh, from the first time he took me out to a creek, and showed me what a muskrat slide was and helped me put a number one long spring there in the creek at the bottom of that slide. And when I caught a muskrat, that, that was it for me. I've been hooked ever since. And uh, he and I spent a lot of time together that way. He was my best friend growing up. And uh, a lot of what I do work-wise, uh, he's what got that started in me. Uh, he worked for the Forest Service. He knew all about the woods, and he kept me in the woods. And uh, that was my interest in forestry. And then he loved to hunt and fish and trap, and that's what we did. And so as I, you know, left high school and went into college, I thought I want to do something that I enjoy doing, and that's what I did, and it's worked out well for me. God's blessed me tremendously to be able to do what I do. And I think I owe that to the next generation with my family and other families too, to at least introduce people to uh, those things that, that I enjoy and that can be passed on to the next generation. If we were to, uh, when things get back to normal, whenever that is, um, would you be willing to come up and teach a little more uh, hands-on 
uh, trapping class for us? Yeah, absolutely. You learn a lot more hands-on than you do watching this computer. Yeah. I'd be glad to do uh, I know that. One. Bill and I talked about doing that one time and then I forget what kept us from doing it, but I'm, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Good deal. What, when seasonally is the best time? Is it mostly the winter thing? I didn't hear what you said. I said, is it mostly a winter thing or uh, when is the best time to, to plan for something like that? It, winter time, except you have to watch the weather. I mean, you know, doesn't have to be the winter time, but it's it's better that way. You don't have to worry about the ticks, chiggers, and mosquitoes, and snakes, and all that stuff. So maybe we could look for some time in the fall. I hope. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of this computer stuff. Yeah. I guess it's better than nothing, but I'll tell you what, it's not. It's not real. I mean. The information's good, but it's not the same. But yeah, I'd be glad to do that, Shad, or Jeremy, or Phil, or whoever.